Hi, everyone. This is Sima, the inclusionist with everyday conversations on race for everyday people. If you have ever wanted to have a conversation on race, but were afraid to do so because you were afraid of either saying the wrong thing or being ignored or trivialized, then this podcast is for you. We need your help to reach more people with our message of ending racism, stopping hate and spreading love. If you like what you hear today, go to www.racecombo.com, download more episodes, share the show with everyone you know, and now you can make a tax-deductible donation to help us with production, editing, and promotion. Let's get that word across the globe. I am so excited about my guests today because it's three other people. We're all colleagues and friends. And we're all consultants and members of a great organization called the Inclusion Allies Coalition, which is one reason why I brought everybody together for this podcast. So I'm going to have each of these, each person give you two minutes, not two minutes, two sentences about themselves. They're going to give you their name, their cultural background, because some of you can't see them if you're not watching this on video. We'll start with you, Greg. Your face is the biggest one right now on my screen. So, Greg. My name is Greg Jenkins. Culturally, I am a older, white, straight male of a Catholic upbringing. Uh, ra- lived and raised in the part of the U- U.S. I spent 28 years in the U.S. Army, and I've been a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant for the last 17 years. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to... My friend, Eleanor. My name's Eleanor Stutz. My company, Smooth Sail. And I was brought up with a Jewish heritage, but told not to tell anybody about it. Mm. So my lips were sealed all these years, just so you know. Okay, I got to ask this question. So they said, don't tell anybody. Were people in your family Holocaust survivors or just impacted? Absolutely. And that made a huge difference. So I want to hear more about that. We're going to come back to you. Okay, Narupa. Hi, Sima. So great to be with you today. My name is, I was born in Guyana in South America, and I emigrated to Florida when I was about age nine. I am an attorney and also DEI consultant. My company is called Lotus Solutions, LLC. And culturally, I am of Indian descent. And as we talked about earlier, also a Hindu. Thank you all so much for being on this show. So my first question now, I can call on people, but also you could just jump in too. Why do you think it's important to talk about race today? We can't have silence now because this is You always said you're going to call on us. All right, I'll call on you. Okay. All right. Last person. Why is it an important conversation? Well, I think these are discussions that are happening globally in response to so many issues that are, that are happening and continue to happen. So I think it's conversations happening in workplaces, happening over dinners and lunches. So I think it is important that we are having the open conversations about race and the role it plays, particularly in the workplace. Okay, thank you. Okay, Greg. I would add to to what Narupa just said, and then also I think it would be important for for us and your audience, your global audience, to understand that race is is a very Western idea. The conversation when we talk about a graduation or or taxonomy or categorization of how we we categorize people is important to like provide context. But I I think in the context where in those parts of the world where race is an understood terminology, to understand the the effects of race and racism is important for us to you know in in the case of the IAC help us understand people that are suffering because of the negative impacts of racism. And IAC being Inclusion Allies Coalition. It is. Yes, it is. Inclusion Allies Coalition. Thank you. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And okay, Eleanor. Okay. My viewpoint today is the news is horrific Mm -hmm. and brings to question the idea of race Mm -hmm. and why people are so nasty 
toward one another and what we can do to correct the situation. In the work environment, when I was in sales arenas, it was men against the one woman on the sales uh, team. And that was awful. I can't even imagine if I had different color skin, what it might have been like. And so it's coming to light now more and more the essential necessity for discussing it, getting it out in the open and mm -hmm. inclusively coming to agreement on how we can move forward for a better environment for society. I love that. And this is related to Eleanor. Can you tell us a, more about your background and the fact that you were raised not to talk about being Jewish? Okay, yes. My grandparents, at the very last moment, were able to get on a boat, not as passengers. I think they were down probably in the baggage compartment and came to the States. And they built successful businesses, businesses in my blood. And my dad's side of the family also seemed to have escaped and he became an entrepreneur, but I was adamantly told to never, ever discuss my religion, not let anyone know because of the fear what happened in Germany could very easily happen here. So I believe it was out of fear. And that is the difference too, that for a, often, uh, for a lot of people whose family, because I'm sure you must have lost people in the Holocaust, that it's not uncommon for Jewish people who have lost people in the Holocaust for the survivors to tell their kids, don't talk about being Jewish. Yeah, because and, and I just, excuse me, I just read in the paper or saw it on Twitter about the horrible signs in L.A., the anti-Semitic signs, and people even in Beverly Hills were being interviewed. It's horrible what's going on, on in every capacity, not just Jews, Asians, everyone. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and my philosophy, I just talked about this yesterday. I did a reel on Facebook and I said that, yes, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Definitely. I mean, it's been there. And so is racism and that it's very important. And then there's people who I said, if you're black and Jewish, it's, it's even harder for you right now. And that it's really important for people who have been victims of hate to be able to stand together. So like for Jewish people, it's not enough to just be against anti-Semitism, but we also have to speak out. Speaking as a Jewish person, we also have to speak out when we see racism against people who are black or brown or Asian. You can't just say, oh, this is only about me but you have to be willing to stand up with other people because that's the only way. I agree with you. Excuse me. I realized that it was wrong to hide from it. You need to come out and work together to find the solution. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't wrong. It was that it was done out of fear of survival mm -hmm. yes. based on what they had seen, based on yeah. what they had seen because they had seen, have seen horrors that we have only seen on television. We've only seen it and what we've heard about, which is horrible enough. And it is important for groups to stand together and to really speak out together, which is one reason why I think we're all part of inclusion, the Inclusion Allies Coalition. And I would like each of you to just speak about the Inclusion Allies Coalition and what it means to you and the opportunities that you've had to interact with people who are different than you. Mm -hmm. So, Greg, we could, we could start with you since you're like the longest term member and you're kind of Mr. IAC in a way. Well, I <clears throat> thank you, Sim. I don't know if I'm Mr. Uh, Inclusion Allies Coalition, but I've, I've been volunteering for a while with them. Well, I what is it? Tell us what it is. What is yeah, it? Yeah, okay. what I've learned from that organization why it's valuable to me is that, you know, it's a coming together of people literally from all over the world that in some cases have been negatively impacted by the conversations that we're having around racism or, so, or some other aspect of their diversity that whether it be sexual orientation or gender or religion or whatever the case may be, 
and they're they are people that are interested in in helping be advocates for people that may be suffering or negatively impacted by uh, by the topics that we're referring to here. And so the value I find in it is I find networking with other colleagues that are trying to do good, positive things in their world. And that world could be something within an organization that they are in. Maybe they're trying to develop an employee resource group, or maybe they're trying to get into a new market that caters to people that, that we haven't sold our goods and services to. Or maybe it's something in terms of social justice, where there's some, like Eleanor's talking about, a tragedy so bad in her family's history that she was told to stay quiet about it for her own protection. That's astounding. And I, I really appreciate, Eleanor, you sharing that with us today here on this, on this podcast. So I, I think I'm motivated by being able to be with people like that, that are trying to do good things in the world and in their communities and continue to grow that connection. Okay, thank you. So what is the Inclusion Allies Coalition exactly? What is it? Most of these people listening to the show, they don't know what the Inclusion Allies Coalition is. You know, lay it out as best you can. Greg. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure who you're talking to. Well, again, because well, so, you can't see that I'm looking at you, but you can't see that. I'm yeah, well, I can't look at it all four of us here, right? Yeah. yeah. But you know, it, it is a it is a grouping of of individuals and organizations, in fact, uh, that, as I was saying, advocate for you know promoting inclusion, uh, helping organizations and individuals that are that are trying to make good positive change in the world. Some of that can be advocacy. Some of that can be resources. That that can be networking. That can result in mentoring, that can be in the promotion through social media of how we want to promote uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so it's an organization that, that does those things and others. Thank you. Narupa, how about you? How do you see it? I echo much of what Greg said, but I think for me, Inclusion Allies is a way to connect folks with folks globally about DEI and also- And what's DEI? Because most of the people listening to the show don't even know what DEI is, you know, because we have all kinds of people. DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So being an IAC member allows you to gain that access, as Greg mentioned, to global practitioners, whether it's individuals, whether it's organizations, doing DEI and Another benefit of IAC is it allows you to be educated on trending topics in DEI and leadership so that your knowledge base is current. And I have to say, IAC is how all of us met. We actually met through social media, so the conversations and connections that can form by being a member of the IAC. And, uh, so, okay, so, and Eleanor, what has it meant to you in terms of pe meeting people who are different? Oh, um, I never fit in where I was just because I was a female. So I began traveling at age 16. I've been to many, many countries and I love meeting people from all around the world. And my experience in corporate was horrific. And, um, but there were some good lessons to be learned. And then because of my experience, I saw tweets by a Mr. Greg Jenkins that were so nice. I thought, what's wrong with this man? I have to talk to him to find out what his story is. And when he told me about his ambition for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I, I said, please count me in on the social media committee because that's very important to me that everybody has input we should all be, see the value in one another. And I don't understand why that never happens. And that an organization is behind it gives more power to let this spread out globally. That, of course, that's right now wishful thinking, but I hope it does happen one day. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and I think for me, what I like, I mean, I consider myself very knowledgeable. I mean, I've traveled. I know people from all different countries across the world, but I don't know a whole lot of things that I, you know, there's a lot that I don't know. And what I like about Inclusion Allies Coalition is it puts me in contact with people that I normally wouldn't know like uh, every day, like people from Rwanda um, or people from some of the Asian countries that I may not 
be in contact with every single day. And it creates a space for people to actually interact and to learn from each other. And for me, that's really important. And one, cause one question that people say, ask, they ask me a lot because they know about my work and they see who I am and, and, and who I'm around. And they say, well, I would like to know people who are different, but I don't know how you do that. And I said, well, you know, if you just stay in your own little world, in your own little neighborhood, mm -hmm. you're not going to meet anybody who's different. And you have to be curious. You have to really want to because people say, well, I don't have time to meet anybody else. Well, is it important or not? If it's not important, just say I don't care. It's not important. It doesn't matter. To, but for me, it's important. And I know for all of you, it's very important. And what I like about Inclusion Allies Coalition and, and when people say, you know, how do you meet people? You get involved with different organizations. You look for organizations where you're going to, that's going to enable you to be in contact with people who are different than you. And you could learn. And one thing that we have in IAC that for me really advances the race conversation is we have different kinds of webinars on almost mm. every single topic mm -hmm. related to diversity, equity, inclusion. And uh, we had one on, on CRT on critical race theory. What else have we had? What else have we had when we talk about these kinds of issues or what's going on globally or race wise or any other oh. kind of different? Sima, there's been a, there's been a, 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 a broad range of topics ranging from, uh, you know, gender disparity to social, uh, or excuse me, to, to sexual orientation challenges and experiences, uh, religious differences. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on. And if, you know, if your listeners or, you know, watchers go to Inclusion Allies Coalition uh, website, uh, and you know, and want to become a member. Those those are all all available to those people who would like to do that. Um, I think the other thing that it's your that I'm hearing from you, Sima, is the reason why the Inclusion Allies Coalition uh, is as is as as attractive as it is, is is because you've got you have conversations there in that space that I don't see very much of my own. You know, in other places. You know, 17 years into this business. And so if, if you really have a desire and a passion to, to have, be part of conversations and you're looking for those conversations, I would say Inclusion Allies Coalition is, is one of those places, one of those few places uh, where you can have those kinds of conversations. And I'd like to add one thing about that too, because in some cases we might be, a person might be curious about, like you said, I like your word curious about race uh, or power discrimination, sexism, racism, those kinds of things. But they don't know what, where to go, uh, who to talk to, because I, I don't want to look like I'm racist or sexist, so I, I'll, I'll avoid it. And really, that's kind of uh, how I got into the space. And so I can understand if somebody is really hesitant, because I was hesitant when I was in the Army, and then the Army wanted me to go into the space. I didn't want to have anything to do with it, because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say anything. I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't want to appear foolish. So I avoided, but I think in the case of the Inclusion Allies Coalition, it provides a, a safe space for entry into those conversations and people who can help you without being judgmental and being, you know, can provide you with mentoring and coaching and assistance. Uh, so you can start to at least get into those conversations to begin with. And I think that's where a lot of the change happens is when you have those conversations. Absolutely. And, you know, and at the same time, it's like, if you're a white person and you don't know any black people or any brown people, it's kind of inappropriate to just go up to somebody and go, well, <laughs> tell me about this. How does this work? Blah, 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 blah. I mean, first of all, it's exhausting for people. <laughs> it's inappropriate. And sometimes it's just like you perpetuate ignorance. So it's important to find out information and talk to other people first and that this is a good place. So Eleanor, what what about what about you? And, and I'm curious. I'm curious, Eleanor. What do you remember? What was the, what was the first time you ever met anybody who was different than you? Uh, oh, if, with the memory that comes back, I'm sure it was before. It was in high school. Um, everybody I knew was going to this white high school that was academically in good shape to get you in, straight into college. 
But I didn't like any of those people. They were snobby, arrogant, you name it. And I decided to go to Los Angeles High School instead, where it was intermixed. And again, that goes with my theme of meeting people from around the world. And uh, I met many people from different parts of the world, and I found it fascinating to interact with them. You know, and another question I have is, when we look at differences, and, and you were told to hide your difference, no matter, generally, unless it goes back generations and generations and generations and generations, when you're for a particular culture, that culture gets handed down in different ways. So as a Jewish person, even though you weren't allowed to talk about it outside, of course, they were worried about, about preservation, you still were embedded in Jewish culture, like the way that we, do, a lot of the ways that we do things. So I have to ask, what was it like for you when you were out in the world, you weren't supposed to talk about being Jewish and you're around all these other people, like you're around all these other like white people who look, I mean, the same color skin, but they're not from the, the Jewish culture. Did you ever feel just really weird? Oh, all the time, because people always told me I was weird. <laughs> that was my brand. But nevertheless, my grandmother lived with us when I was growing up, and she spoke Yiddish. And I became so accustomed to hearing it, I didn't know whether she was speaking Yiddish or English. So my grammar became intermixed. The sentences were half English and half Yiddish. And Late years later, I guess by the time, you know, in high school or so, teachers told me my writing was awful. They couldn't understand what I was writing, but they liked the themes of what I was writing. It was really interesting. So then I became more cautious about the words I was choosing. And Pete, one guy, though, my brother's friend said I was brilliant because I could speak an answer in English when someone was speaking to me in another language rather than transferring to the other language. I thought that was an interesting, that was the nicest compliment I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, those of you who are listening, Eleanor is a best-selling author. And one of her most <laughs> famous books is Nice Girls Do Get the Sale. Now, Narupa, I want to ask you a question. What was your first experience with somebody who was different than you? I was very lucky. Growing up, I was born in Guyana, and my parents moved to the neighboring country of Suriname, um, where I had to learn Dutch at the age of five and go into school into a language I didn't speak. So I felt like growing up, I had been surrounded by so much diversity, including race, and it was a great experience, a very positive one. It wasn't, unfortunately, until I moved to the U.S. when I was about age nine that I began to experience the negative aspects of race and racism. I was certainly treated differently, and I don't know if that's because I'm also a woman, I'm immigrant. I am a person of color. I didn't know the reasoning, but I would walk into stores and I would just be ignored or looked at a certain way like I didn't belong. And it would happen in restaurants. And I have to say, Sima, unfortunately, those experiences still happen mm -hmm. very often. So what was that like for you coming from a country where most people were people of color, right? Absolutely. And then you come to the U.S. and all of a and and people are treating you like the other and ignoring you. What was that like? I mean, because because a lot of times you know people listen to the show really like to hear what's happening with people personally because they don't have. Oftentimes, people don't get to have these real conversations. They don't really find out how other people are thinking. Mm -hmm. So, could you talk a little bit more about your personal experience and what that what, what that felt like for you? Well, I remember not knowing what was happening. It did not dawn on me as a child that I was being treated because of my differences, that they weren't being welcomed because I grew up in an environment where it was welcomed and I didn't have this negative feeling. So for a long time, I didn't know what was happening. You know, you're thinking, is it something about me? Am I dressed a certain way? And so for a long time, I didn't know. And then it began to dawn on me. I remember in high school, a dear friend of mine 
we went into an upscale retail establishment. I won't name the name as they're still in business. And we did a test. And I said, let's, let's, let me go in first and you'll see what happens. And what happened was no one approached me. I got the look of why is she here? Once my friend walked in, who my friend happened to be white, she got the great red carpet service. How are you? What can we help you find today? So she got to see it firsthand, what it was like being me. Mm -hmm. And how did you react? What did you say to her? Did you say, hey, now you know? <laughs> I didn't have to say anything to her. She said, I can't imagine that this is what you experience. And even to this day, describing those experiences, you know, in the restaurants, when they do it, they don't stop looking at you. So you're going through dinner and trying to have a great experience. And you know that all eyes are on you and think you don't belong there. Mm -hmm. And so what about now? What do you do now? Because now, now you know what's going on. How do you deal with it now? Now I do my best to ignore it. And I likely won't frequent that establishment. You know, sometimes your friends like a certain place, so you'll end up going. But I've actually been sharing with my friends, I'd rather not go there because of X, Y, Z experience. Mm -hmm. And they completely understand. But sometimes, you know, sometimes this treatment is by staff and patients. Yes. Well, depending on it, I'm a big believer in second chances. So sometimes I'll go back. Say it's an experience where the staff treated me a certain way, I will give them a second chance. And I've had positive interactions there. So I believe people are fundamentally good and capable of change. And that's why we do this DI work, right? Mm -hmm. Eleanor, you and I, we all do it because we want to change behavior and make a positive impact on people and planet. I have a question. Do you think that younger generations are more accepting of DEI or it's still the steady, the same? The reason I'm asking is I had, I was in a conversation last week that really annoyed me. Um, <laughs> they were saying they were upset that Columbus Day is no longer going to be, and this may be politically correct for me to bring it up, but I said, Columbus Day, why are you celebrating him? Because he discovered America. I said, no, he didn't. The indigenous people were here. How could you even think that? And they were so upset with me. You couldn't believe it. I love you, Eleanor. <laughs> I, speak uh, I have to say, I, I, again, believe people are well-intentioned and capable of change. And I would like to see you know, the future and upcoming generations, that they are more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I sure hope so. Well, I think there's more opportunities. At the same time, um, when, when you look at people who are marching, like the hate marchers, like the Proud Boys, and um, all these other white supremacists or people who, are in, who, who have that white supremacist mentality, even if they're not white, a lot of those people are young. You know, when you look at who was marching in Charlottesville, they were young people. And oftentimes people say, well, young people today, they'll say, well, young people today, they don't need to know about diversity. They don't really even know, need to know about race. They, they don't, you know, they don't see any difference. Well, it's a problem when you don't see any difference because if, if there's no difference, it's kind of boring. But um, people will say, yeah, young people today. And I said, no, who was marching in Charlottesville? The guy that killed uh, the young woman who was marching. Heather Heyer. He was, Heather Heyer. He was young. A lot of these people, the people January 6th, I didn't see a lot of old people. I'm sure there were a lot of old people. But those people, the, a lot of those people were like young people. So I think there's just more opportunities now for young people. There's more conversation. But at the same time, people, white supremacists, are really, they are looking for young, alienated people because people want to feel part of something. And a lot of young people are alienated. A lot of young white people are alienated because they don't have a sense of community. 
And so what's hap what's happening is that on the internet and other places like that, they're trying to pull people to be able to say, hey, we have a place for you. And it's it's a fault of the people of color. It's a fault of Jewish people. It's a fault of gay people that you don't feel good about yourself. But if you come with us, we'll help you. So that's my take on the whole thing about generations. What do you, Greg, you want to say something? Sima, can I, can, I, uh, can I jump in a little bit there? Please uh, do. I, I think that, you know, regardless of the society of which you're talking about, because because every society is made up of people and there's there's going to be issues between different classes and different genders and different orientations and, and different, you know, socioeconomic uh, uh, realities. I, 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 don't think, I don't think we're unique in that regard. Uh, we're unique, I suppose, in our history of, of racism. Uh, you know, we have a very, a very well documented history of, of how how our country has grown and developed, and you know, with with a number of a number of subjects that we could go into uh, in, into in depth. But I think another thing to think about, though, too, is is the changing demography of not only the world but then also the U.S. And so, you know, you're going to have some opinions from various generations of, of if they think that's good or bad. One thing that I'd like to bring up for, for your listeners today is, is, you know, if you take a look at the U.S. Census Bureau data, you know, in 2000, that was the first year, and we have the U.S. Census every 10 years, that was the first year that you could select more than one race. And then 10 years later, in 2010, Nine billion Americans had selected two. Nine billion races. Americans. Nine million. Oh, nine, nine million. million. Million with an M. Okay. And then, and then, ten years later, in 2020, that rate of nine million had increased 276 percent up to 33.8 million. So you know, and these are predominantly younger Amer younger adults, right? Because you're going to be 18 to take the census. So I, I think we've got it's a it's a palette of of experience and expression that's going on, but we have a very rapidly growing portion of our of our country. Matter of fact, about ten percent of them uh, that they view when they look at when you ask them, well, you know, tell me about your mom and dad, and they'll think, well, my mom's white, my dad's black, or my dad's white, my mom's Asian, or or whatever combination. So for some folks, like maybe the ones that you're referring to in Charlottesville, that, that frightens them a little bit, perhaps. Uh, again, remember, I was the guy who didn't want to go into the diversity space because I was a little frightened too. And so I think going back to why the Inclusion Allies Coalition is an important place is that we can have conversations that we don't have normally, and we should, like this podcast. We're talking about it right now. So uh, there's changes going on. There, there will continue to be those changes, but I, but I think your efforts here, Sema, and this, and the the efforts of the IAC and others is to create spaces to have the conversations. So, and I'm gonna, I, I think you're absolutely right that we have to be able to create the spaces to have the conversations because they don't just happen. No, I mean for us they may just happen because that's who we're around. I mean that's just like every day. That's this everyday thing. But for a lot of people, they don't just happen. And we have to create spaces where people can actually talk about these things and where we could facilitate these conversations so that people can be comfortable. Um, you know, but I have a question for you, too. What would you like? And you said that your friends are supportive. What do you think, like, if somebody's, like, say, a white person um, and they're with you and they see people dissing you or treating you poorly but they're treating all the white people great what would you like your friends to do what would be important for them to be able to do to show support for you that's a great question Sima. um i think just you know maybe us openly talking about it instead of you know going about our say we're having a meal us openly talking about it um ways that, that they can be an ally to me and folks like me discussing what that means to them. Because not everyone is, say I'm in a situation like that and someone you know is looking at me, I don't necessarily expect a friend of mine to jump out of their chair and go over and confront someone. So I think us having the dialogue and just talking about the experience, I find talking through scenarios that negatively impact us 
really help. You don't always have to respond. And I will tend to not respond versus respond to something that's negative. I why should I give you that attention? Mm -hmm. I don't even think I belong in this restaurant, in this store, or sometimes even on this planet. But if somebody is actually like dissing you, like treating you poorly, wouldn't you want somebody, one of your friends to say something? I mean, it's like, I know for me, like when I've been places, um, well, I had I have a friend who used to work for uh, BART, which is like the train train station. And she's she was black. She passed away. She, so she was black. And I would be sitting in her booth talking to her. I don't know nothing about no bar. It's not my thing. You know, bar's not my jam. I don't work at BART. But oftentimes, and most of the time it would be white people, not always, but they would ask a question and they would ask me the question. I'm like, I don't know. You know, but they would assume because I was white that therefore I'm the person in charge. So I would just say, either I would ignore them so they'd have to ask my friend, you know, I just pretend I didn't hear them. Or I would just say, I said, don't ask me. I said, don't assume I'm, I said, I don't work here. She does. At which point there'd be like a little bit of awkwardness because in their mind they're thinking, oh, well, it should be this white person, blah, 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 blah. So I think it's important for people to, to recognize what's going on and not to say to you, oh, Rupa, oh, it's okay. You know, it's just your imagination. Oh, Sima, can I, can I jump in? And I, I want to yeah. thank Rupa for sharing her experiences. And I think you're absolutely right. We need to acknowledge what has happened so that it's not it's not glossed over and ignored as like well that's that really wasn't that important it really wasn't that bad perhaps you know the things that you shared in Europa, uh they're wrong period let's let's just be clear and i'm really sorry you've had to experience those things and i mean that absolutely and and so i i think at the very least sema and i'm not in any way am i trying to talk for Europa here at all uh, but but Sima, your, your your question I think is really important because if I'm going to be a, not a bystander but an upstander, at, at the very least I should acknowledge like wow that was a really inappropriate comment you did not deserve that at the very least, and who knows how that I mean we're talking a notional situation right now right, uh, but I think at the very least we should acknowledge the the injustice that just happened no matter how slight. Uh, so that we we value and respect the person that has had that just was the target of that. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes the person who's the target, if you're the only person, or, if you, or as Eleanor knows, if you're the only woman in the right. room, that sometimes you may not be the right person to say something. That you need somebody. Like if you're the only woman, you need a man to come and not to take over or speak for you, but to support you. You know, just to support you. I speak up for myself. <laughs> but for but for many women, I can, I can see but, where this is going to go. <laughs> no, but but for many women, they don't. If you're the only one, and not that you want anybody to speak for you, but you want to know that you're not alone in your thinking. And it's the same thing, like for a person of color, you don't want anybody to speak for you, but at the same time, you want you you need to be supported so that you don't feel like. This is going to go nowhere. Yeah. Okay. You so know. the other side of this spectrum, I was raised with a boy and I learned how to deal with him and then many others. And you meet what they're dishing out at you. You meet it and raise it a level. So they stop. They realize they met someone who won't accept it. But what's going on with what Narupa said reminded me of long ago when I was 10 years old, we drove across country and we're in a restaurant, a, you know, some kind of cafe or whatever, and must have been, sorry, partly in the South. And um, what was I going to say? There was a sign on the table. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. And I said to my parents, what, if they're in business, why on earth would they have a sign like that? It makes zero sense. And I got, shh, be quiet. I said, why? I said, I want to go ask the owner 
Lord, what's that mean? Said, no, 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 don't do that. I was 10. <laughs> this makes me think I would love to experience, not that I want to have a ne negative experience, but I'd love to have you there, Eleanor, <laughs> to see. And I think the point of what we just talked about is that we have those discussions, right? Mm -hmm. We have it when it's happening. But I don't expect someone to be confrontational because with what we've seen with the unprovoked attacks based on race and other factors of diversity, there, there's some bad things happening, you know, in our country that really are just based on people's differences. Mm -hmm. So much division in our country. I, I hope that we will become more united and this crime wave based on race and et cetera will, will end. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to know when to speak up, how to speak up. And sometimes, you know, if there's danger, that might be the time that you need to like leave and not just stay. Right. You know, at the same time, I really believe that it's important for us to be able to support each other, to support people who are being left out in any way. You know, like, like Greg was calling himself an older, you're not really older, Greg, but say you were older. And somebody was making comments about saying, hey, old man, get out of here. You know, and you're the oldest person there. You would want some, you'd want to know, you'd want to feel safe. You'd want to know there were people there who would support you in some way or another. You'd want to know that they're, that everybody is not against you. Yeah. You would know, feel a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. That brought up another idea is that when you take the negative, you turn it into a positive. When we moved to uh, the East Coast, I went to DC for business events and nobody would talk to me because I'm an older female. They just ignored me even when I said hello. So that convinced me it was time to start the blog. And that took off. Yeah, well, your blog so certainly good. did take off. Well, it sure did. Good came, came, good came out of the awful experience. So you have yeah. to look for those nuggets of when to, you know, switch paths yeah. to move yeah. forward. All right. Go ahead, Greg. I was going to say, you know, for your listeners, here, there's a, there's a, uh, the 4D tool. I'll just run through it real quickly because for your listeners that may be facing a situation like you're describing, they don't know what to do. And the four Ds are delay, distract, delegate, and direct. And so you're right. So sometimes it's like, walk away, right? Delay a response because it's just not safe for you to do something. That's okay. The second one is distract. Maybe, you know, you distract the person or somebody or a bystander or an upstander distracts the attacker and what's going on. And, and the distraction can be very a very minor thing, but it gets their attention drawn somewhere else. Number three is delegate. Maybe you know somebody who knows how to address the situation that's going on, maybe in the moment or after the moment. And then the lastly is to directly address what's happening. But I think your, your point is good. You, how do you know, you know, if you don't know anything to do, if you don't have any tools, you don't know what to do. And sometimes we just freeze uh, and then we just take the abuse and, uh, and we should be figuring out strategies and tools uh, of, of how to address things that are happening to us like the 4D approach. Oh, I agree. And I think it's important to actually practice in your mind. Like I practice yeah. scenarios. I mean, I, I, you know, I, you know, what if somebody is attacking a black person or attacking a gay person, or whatever, what am I going to do? And because research showed that oftentimes when people see something happening, the reason they don't say anything is because one, they don't know what to do, even though they, they know what to do. Wrong. Right. So that's, and that, but that's not good enough. If you know now, then you need to start practicing what you do so it becomes automatic. Because you can't, for me, I can't allow injustice. I have to see it like it's happening to me. So when I see somebody's being attacked by because of their race or the gender or their sex, whatever it is, in my mind, I have to take it personally so that I can take whatever is the right action to take at that moment and not pretend that it's okay, which is oftentimes, you know, I'll see people do that. Oh, don't worry. They didn't mean like to the only black person, the only Asian person. Oh, don't worry. They didn't mean anything about it. Joe is a really good guy. No, Joe's not a really good guy. Joe's being racist. Joe's not a good guy. Maybe he's a good guy to you because you're white or you're a man or whatever. No, but 
we do have to stand up, which is why we have inclusion allies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So when you're feeling like you're all alone out there, <laughs> there is a place where people are 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 very welcoming and being, and we you know be a great place to check out and be involved in because you're not alone. And when you say like inclusion allies, is about any every kind of allyship. I mean, allyship around race, but allyship around gender, allyship around sexual orientation, allyship around ethnicity, that we could all be allies of each other. And I'm looking at time. This time has gone so fast, and it's almost 3 o'clock. And I um, always love talking to everybody because, like, they're my peeps. But I'm going to ask. Here's one last question, because people always want to know. For each of you, I want to know, do you have any, now usually I'll ask people each of these, since there's so many of us and time is, is moving. I want, I need to ask if you to recommend either a movie or film or TV show or a song that reflects what's going on today around race and differences or allyship. And I, 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 you don't have to be like, uh, like I saw that. Okay, I'm, I'll go first. I recommend this movie that I saw called Ur, R, R, R. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It takes place in India when the British were in control of India. And it's a three hour movie. It shows the racism that the people of India had to deal with by Great Britain. The music's amazing. And it centers around these two revolutionary guys. The music, the story is amazing. You really learn a lot. The dancing's incredible. The plot is great. And the acting is terrific. So that's me. All right. I'm going to ask all of you. Let's go. Okay. Eleanor, you're at the top. Oh, my goodness. I Unfortunately, with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, the eve of destruction by, <laughs> I was going to say Bob Dylan, I believe. Uh, comes to mind, which I hope uh, that never occurs, but it's really disheartening. And uh, there was a book, but I, I don't recall it right now. I'm sorry. Okay, that's cool. All right. Europa, how about you? The book I would recommend that comes to mind is Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Yes. Because I think people think the idea of Cast was so long ago in our history. And it's a great educational piece. I, I won't give away too much about what the book is, but it it made me even frame my experiences with racism in a different way. So I would highly recommend that book. And you just don't have to be in the DI space. It's just a great educational learning about caste systems and how they take place in many other countries besides India. Cast is an amazing book. It also shows a relationship about how Nazis came to the United the Third Reich, when they were starting the Third Reich, they came to the United States to learn how the United States, how, how they institutionalized segregation. And they also learned from how they from slavery how to enslave the Jewish people. I mean, it was like a whole science that they did. Cast is such a good book. Okay, Greg. It's a movie that I'm going to suggest, and it's called The Best of Enemies. And it is a movie based on a true life story of two people. One is a KKK grand wizard, and the other person, the other protagonist is a black woman who was and these, these, this white man and this black woman had had to come together to figure out how to solve a schooling problem that their both communities had to live with in the Deep South. And it's a fantastic example of, of contact theory, where you can take very different groups of people, put them together, like we're talking here perhaps, and have them work together. And those two people who really didn't like each other at the beginning ended up becoming, you know, doing public speaking together for years around the U.S. Fantastic movie. Can't highly more uh, recommend it. Best of Enemies. I'll watch it. Well, I want to thank all of you for being on the show. The time went just way, way, way too fast. We'll do it again. I mean, we'll do it again because, you, know, <laughs> you know, we talk every week. So we'll do it again. And I'm going to, and for people who are listening, I'm going to get everybody's 
contact information and the social media and inclusion allies information, all of that will be on the website. But if you're interested in Inclusion Allies Coalition, what's what's the website? What's our website, Craig? Uh, in inclusionalliescoalition.com. Oh, okay. Well, that's easy. Yeah, but yeah. You know, and um, Just Google that. Okay. Thank you so much. I really, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you all very soon. I'm sure I will on Zoom. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. A fabulous mm -hmm. conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, everyone, this is Sima the Inclusionist. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this episode, then go to www.raceconvo.com, download more episodes, and spread the word to all of your friends. We welcome your tax-deductible donations to help pay for editing, production, and promotion. Just hit the donate button on the site. No amount is too little or too much. And if you want more of me, you can email Sima at SimaLieberman.com and I can help you create real inclusive work cultures from the inside out, facilitate dialogues across differences in your organization, and or speak or lead a panel at your next conference. We'd also love to get your comments or suggestions for our guests. Let's spread that love and stop hate. Until next time, Sima the Inclusionist.